Hi guys, welcome to my channel. I am so happy you came here today. And today I wanted to bring a good friend, a endocrinologist who who knew an endocrinologist that thinks like the metabolic health doc, right? Dr. Sang Aini. And I wanted to bring her uh, to this channel and to this video because she and I always have an opinion about uh, different things, rather it's the ADA guidelines, the uh, AACE which is the Endocrinology uh, Association uh, guidelines and recommendations. It's important that we look at that and, and kind of dissect it a little bit. And, and I'm curious if she agrees with some of the things they're recommending. Uh, I have some question marks about that. So I just wanted to bring her to the video to have this conversation. So I think it's very powerful that we think outside the box, have the courage to channel and a challenge conventional thinking. And that's what we're doing today. So doc, let's talk a little bit about what they're recommending and how, what's your interpretation of some of those recommendations? Oh yeah, thank you, Tony. This was an interesting thing to talk about, right? It's you wanna say the right thing without upsetting anyone. Right. And at the same time, <laughs> uh, uh, and not alienating anyone. And at the same time, waking some people up. So I'm gonna try my best to do that. What I'll do is, walk you through some of my objections that I go through when I look at the ADA guidelines. Yeah. Right. And full disclaimer, I'm heavily biased for lifestyle change as the first treatment for type two diabetes or metabolic health. Right there with okay. you. I think you, you have okay. no competition. <laughs> no conflict of interest. Right, no issues. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, these guidelines are made for, I think, I read it from the lens of a busy doctor. I'm a busy doctor, the ADA every January. So now in two months, 2024, January, we'll have the new one. It comes out once a year with the new guidelines. And we read that to stay up to date. We read that to stay out of trouble as doctors. We want to do what the guidelines say so we don't get some you know, malpractice problems. And we want to do what's right for our patients. Um, and because I'm obsessed with lifestyle change, I'm always looking for the new release to see where have they brought it out of the fine print and put it into the algorithm. So when you asked me about algorithm, I was like, oh, this is my chance to tell people what I think. Okay, so, so first of all, the algorithm comes under the chapter of pharmacological management of diabetes. When you go through the lifestyle chapter, you know, they've changed the name over the years. At some time in some editions, it was called lifestyle management. Mm -hmm. And there, there was no algorithm. Then there was a place where they said facilitating healthy behaviors. So it was a behavior change chapter in this document. No algorithm. Then there's a weight management or obesity management chapter. No algorithm. Okay. And why are algorithms so special? Why do we like algorithms? You know, engineers love algorithms. Yeah. It's logical. It's step by step. There's, it's very clear what you need to do. There's no confusion. If this go like this, if yes, here, go here. If no, here, go here. You're not blank. That's right. right. And it's a great resource when you're in a busy clinic and you've got lots of work to do. The, the resource is right with you. Now, here's the catch. It starts off as the pharmacological algorithm. It's colorful. It's, the, it's like the colorful page. Everything else is black and white. And the mind looks for easy to read stuff. Mm. We don't really look at fine print and we should look at fine print, but we don't. So... First of all, it says diet and exercise and lifestyle modification up top in this narrow bar, right. right? And then there's this avalanche of arrows. So it's there because they need to be complete. They can't skip saying that. So they said it. Um, and then there's this really small button on the top right where it says to avoid clinical inertia. Relook at this every three months. Okay. And most of us, unfortunately, because we're reading this in the pharmacology chapter, we mm -hmm. think clinical inertia means drug prescribing inertia. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think of it as inertia to have that conversation to go deeper into the person's lifestyle. That's the inertia we're not talking about. We're talking about prescribing inertia. That's and right. that's how the arrows are nudging you. Whether you like it or not, the arrows kind of go one way. That's the other visual element to this. There are no arrows going up for reversal. Just keeps going. If A1C is not a target, do more of this. Go, go more medication, add medication. So already when you look at a glance, it's all about A1C is not a target. Diabetes is not a target. 
what next add more medication do I need to think about? Wow. It does it doesn't leave creativity there to think about what to do. And the words are on those pages, but it's just not actionable. So for example, it says the lifestyle sections, they use these words. In the weight management section, the words are consider. I don't mm -hmm. know what consider means. You're not telling me what to do. So consider means eh, maybe tomorrow. It says general lifestyle guidance. I don't know what that means. So skip that. Very vague. It says, yeah. The guideline says weight management program. And mm -hmm. the word program is like one little word on this weight management box. What do I mean? A whole program in one word? Right. Gosh, it's taken me years to refine my programs, right? So I don't think right. sticking the word program there helps a busy clinician mm -hmm. design a program. Mm -mm. So it's not really telling okay. you how to do these things. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Right. And low carb is in this document, but it's not in the algorithm. It's in the back somewhere. And if you type low carb and look for it, you won't find it. You have to type low hyphen carb because the hyphen mm. is touching touching the B or touching the W of low. So it's not even a real word, low hyphen. It's just hard to search for. That's, in, that's, that's true because prior to our conversation, I actually was looking for the recommended diet and I was having a hard time. Certainly we didn't find low carb in my search, you know, just this exactly. morning. That's well, because you were searching the normal way, which is right. L-O-D, L-O-W space right. C-A-R-B. But there's mm -hmm. this little line there. And I'll send you a screenshot after this call to see, look, Tony, if you type it like this, it's there. And I'll tell you the language. It's back in the fine print somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it says, in patients who in whom glycemic targets are not being met. First of all, a 10-year-old a won't know what that means. Right. What's that sentence? Let's unpack that. In patients in whom glycemic targets are not being met means your diabetes is high, your glucose is high, okay? In those people, next clause, for whom reducing glucose lowering medication is a priority, comma. So what does that mean? So in someone who has uncontrolled diabetes, who also wants to bring their glucose down with less medication, Oh, I don't know anybody who doesn't want that. I think everybody right. wants that. Right. Yeah. Give me, give me that one. Better diabetes, less medication. Okay. So in those special people, low carb or very low carb is a viable option. Mm. Wow. It's there. It's been there since 2019. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Uh, I do remember uh, when the recommendations to um, suggest low carb is okay from the ADA was kind of a big deal, but why is it so hard to find? And, you know, nobody is really taking that recommendation seriously, at least in the conventional world. So that's no. mind boggling. That's wow. mind boggling. One more, one more really bothersome piece for me is it says it again at the bottom somewhere, patient not meeting target. It says, consider DSME, diabetes self-management education, mm -hmm. consider, mm -hmm. okay? But it doesn't say how that's actually proven to improve outcomes. If you refer someone who's not doing well in diabetes, if you refer them to education and ongoing support, their HbA1c gets better, their self-care habits get better, it's proven, it's cost-effective to send them. And mm -hmm. the word is consider, but everywhere else, when you look at what the medication it says, um, high level of evidence, very convincing evidence, strongly prefer, you know, preferred. There's all this nudging for the prescriptions. And probably the most worrisome part for me is, Tony, we read from left to right. We read from top to bottom. The left side of that algorithm starts with if there is atherosclerotic coronary, you know, cardiovascular disease, ASCVD. So if this diabetes patient of yours also has coronary disease, or if has high risk factors for coronary disease, prefer this ABC class of medication. If the person has heart failure, choose from this bucket. If the person has kidney disease, choose from this bucket. And I'm like, wait, when did we miss the bus here? When did diabetes go to uncontrolled, maybe education, maybe design a program, but if their kidney's damaged, their heart is damaged, and it's failing, and you've got heart attacks going on, we have the medication suggestions for you. Why are we waiting for diabetes to create all that devastation mm -hmm. before, and that's in the first left section, the whole chunk of it is these disease-based decisions. Like, I think we pre didn't prevent it, and that's why we got there. 
That's right. And and it's really uh, perplexing um, that the average clinician hasn't learned or been trained that if you do the disease part, I mean, the, the diet part, you can pretty much fix all of that other stuff downstream. So you can avoid the side effects and costs of medicines. So this is very uh, profound. And I do want to just really quickly touch on the uh, consistency consensus statement from the AACE. And they they made some statements, I think some of which we completely agree. So I just want to get your quick feedback on some of these statements. Number one, lifestyle optimization is essential for our patients with diabetes. Okay. 100%. 100%. Totally okay with that. Number two, minimizing the risk of both severe and non-severe hypoglycemia is a priority. Um, so, you know, your their their focus on hypoglycemia. How would you look at that? Yeah. All right. So let let's back up for one second. Is what is diabetes? It's a condition of high blood sugar. That's right. And now we're worrying about hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. Right. Now, if you have conventional type two diabetes or conventional type one diabetes, right? You don't get into the risk of hypoglycemia until you meet a doctor who prescribes you something that's going to give you hypoglycemia. You're not going to walk around and get hypoglycemia. You're going to have a high blood sugar. That's how we diagnose you. So this is the doctor-patient bit here is why is there a risk of hypoglycemia? That's why, you know, the work you and I do is we do medically supervised lifestyle coaching is if someone was to watch a video of ours and say, oh, I'm going to make all these changes, but they don't adjust the medication with their doctor then they could be in trouble for hypoglycemia. Why? Because the lifestyle change is so powerful right. that your glucose levels are going to come down very rapidly. So somebody has to be on the catching end of that and predicting and anticipating and adjusting those medicines to bring them down. That's right. So in my practice, I knock off the hypoglycemia causing agent. We have choice. You don't have to prescribe stuff that causes hypo. There are plenty of diabetes prescriptions in type 2 that don't cause hypo. So I prefer those. I don't touch the ones that cause hypo in type two. That makes sense. And insulin. Well, I was just going to say, we're treating the disease, not the medication, right? So it's like, so yeah, if you keep exactly. Open, yeah, that doesn't make sense, you know? It doesn't. And even in type one, when you have to give this person insulin to survive, they need it to save their life. Mm -hmm. Even in that case, we can avoid hypoglycemia by sensible adjusting of the dose, teaching your patient how to manage their carbohydrate insulin ratio. So in our, in our practice, the first thing we do is we remove the risk of hypoglycemia. That's right. Let's make them That's safe right. from the hypos and then go after the high glucose. Cause you, you can't, because look, a hypo can be dangerous right now, right here while you're driving, you're crossing That's the right. street in your sleep. It could hurt you today. The high sugars, we could take a few weeks to get those down but we need to take away that risk to get that high, that low glucose risk out. That's right. And, and I'm so happy you clarified, let's reduce the medicines day one, which is why the uh, you know guidelines for therapeutic carb restriction that are provided by Low Carb USA and the Society for Metabolic, you know, of Metabolic Health Practitioners is so helpful. So we'll make sure to have a link to that so that clinicians who are not familiar with how we do therapeutic carb restriction or know-how. Um, I just think that's so important. The other thing I want to mention real quick is if you have a dietary pattern that does not raise your sugar, your glucose much, you know, then you won't have to take as much insulin and therefore you won't have that up and down blood sugar. So I think that's part of the conversation. But the last thing I want to have you comment on before we wrap this video up is the recommend the consensus statement that the A1C of 6.5 is the optimal A1C, right? And I've heard seven, I've heard 6.5, but do you think that's the optimal A1C? It depends on your goals. You know, if your goal is to avoid medication for the next three months, maybe we can push it off to a 6.5 and hold yeah. our breath. That's right. But you still have insulin resistance. How long are you going to hold your breath? If you're, if you're right. going to expect your hair to gray, you know, five years from now, well, we're also expecting your HbA1c to progress five years from now if we don't do anything about this number. It's sitting in the pre-diabetes or just touching diabetes range. So I want to kick the whole disease out. I want to kick the whole syndrome out is let's get rid of the insulin resistance and get a normal HbA1c below 5.7 without medication. 
Absolutely. Why would I expect a person who has diabetes to not live in a normal range? And then I expect people who don't have diabetes to live in a normal range. It doesn't make sense because even if it's borderline abnormal for years, it's going to get you eventually. It's going to still cause damage through the process of glycation and all the inflammatory things that happen. So thank you, doc, for joining me. I just want to provide clarity. I think people need to understand we need to think outside the box and we need endocrinologists as well who are, are also thinking outside the box. So, but I also want to thank you for being a guest on the Protecting Your Nest podcast. I'll make sure to have a link in the video notes for that. And for those who joined us today, I hope you provided some interesting insights. And until the next video with the Metabolic Health Doc, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.